Good morning to all of you. Welcome to the Zoom webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. We are glad to inform that each participant of the CPD webinar will be receiving an e-certificate for the participation. And please stay with us until the end of the session and we'll be releasing the link at the, in the chat box at the end of the session. Uh, so let's move to today's topic. Today's topic is approach to shortness of breath in the emergency department. To avoid interactions during the lecture, kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera and use the chat box to clear your doubts using standard abbreviations at the end of the session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dylan Appersinger, consultant emergency physician currently attached to the District General Hospital, Kegal. Thank you for joining us sir, today, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introductions. Uh, Again, thank you very much for GMO and Chira to uh, start in this sort of a C, uh, uh, lecture series. So I think very helpful. Uh, today, my topic is approach to shortness of breath in the emergency department. So I have uh, selected this, uh, this topic because uh, there are two reasons for that. The first one is uh, last time Dr. Behruguda Arachi who has done the lecture on chest pain. So sort of continuation, I just want to do this uh, topic. The second one is, uh, it's very pathetic situation. Like, you know, I think uh, we are not properly managed you know, uh, uh, shortness of breath in our department. I think this uh, emergence, uh, sorry, shortness of breath is uh, basically corrupted in our departments. So we think that only two differential diagnoses like asthma, COPD and heart failure. So my approach is to uh, uh, give some introduction on shortness of breath and we'll discuss some salient points in few uh, uh, situations. I think you can hear me and you can see the uh, slides, right? If you have any uh, doubts or any questions, just uh, inbox the uh, inbox, right? Okay. So shortness of breath, it's basically a late term is air hunger. It's a difficulty in breathing. It's a subjective symptoms of breathlessness. So it's very unpleasant uh, subjective sensation of abnormal respiration. Basically, it's normally in heavy exertion. Hello? Yes? All right, okay. <laughs> I think interruption, right. It's normal in heavy exertions and it's pathological if it is occurring in expected situations like when you develop a shortness of breath when you are on lie down position or sitting position that is very abnormal so then and there you have to investigate on that right so then the reasons for uh, shortness of breath it's a dearrangement de of oxygenation you know that it's basically due to hypoxia and acidemia however it's a very complex phenomenon Result of stimulation of variety of mechanoreceptors starting from upper airway, lungs, and chest wall. So there is a hypoxia, uh, sometimes variable associate with uh, acidosis. So that will stimulate your respiratory center and uh, with this uh, mechanoreceptors. So that is how you develop this shortness of breath. Right, causes of dyspnea. There are four main types of uh, causes. The first one is cardiac, the second one is pulmonary, third one is mixed cardiopulmonary, and fourth one is non-cardiopulmonary. So what are the examples for each and every one? So cardiac one, cardiac ischemia, congestive heart failure, dysarrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, carditis, then pulmonary wise, asthma, pneumonia, pleural effusion, Hemothorax, pneumothorax, interstitial lung disease, and COPD. Mixed cardiopulmonary it's mechanical obstruction, complex congenital cardiopulmonary diseases. Non cardiac, non cardiopulmonary causes like DKA, sepsis, psychogenics. So, very important to understand 
there is a category called non-cardia and it's also very important for you to understand. Right, as an emergency doctor, the recognition is very important. So as you all know, this MAC card, so that is how we recognize everyone. This is the uh, five steps we have to do. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. So that is how we recognize the problem. So that is called MAC card. So everyone should know about this thing, airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. Right, so when you go through this uh, airway breathing, you, have, you can find red flags. If a patient can talk or patient is in sort of a cat three or cat four situation, you can get a, a little bit of history from the patient or from the bystander. So history is very important here. History of chest pain or faintishness more related to the cardiac causes. History of uh, congestive heart failure or congestive lung disease. Then again, you can categorize into heart or lung. History of trauma. Yes, maybe hemothorax, many hypoxia, hypovolemia. Surgery. Yes, maybe sepsis associated with uh, recent his, uh, season uh, sepsis or pulmonary embolism. Ongoing illness is very important to direct the patient towards cardiac or pulmonary, like hypertension, diabetes, bronchial asthma, COPD, etc. Then you can go again, 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 have a breathing mild. Then if there is a secretion, then upper have a obstruction or swelling, then you can relate it to some upper have a obstruction related infection or swelling may be due to uh, uh, allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. Patient is in grasping, it's basically pre-terminal situation. You have to then and there, you have to treat the patient. Likewise, bradycardia and apnea, yes. Again, pre-terminal. Respiratory distress, what are the features of respiratory distress? Using accessory muscles of respiration, tachypnea, restlessness, sweating, things like that. So shock, bradycardia, arrhythmias, again, pre-terminal. You have to treat then and there. Fever, fever suggestive of sepsis, cyanosis suggestive of hypoxia. Fellow may be due to, uh, you know, again, hypovolemia, rashes related to sepsis. So basically, you have to go through these uh, salient points, red flags, and identify the patient's course. That is very important. So how do you approach the patients? As I earlier said, you have to go through airway breathing circulation wise. First, you check whether the patient is responding or not. If patient is responding, it's okay, you can go... Uh, after that. But if patient is not responding, you have to straight away start CPR. It's very important to start CPR, otherwise patient die. So start CPR if patient is not responding. Yes, if a patient is traumatic patient, you can go primary survey. So first of all, you have to suck out the secretion, prop up the patient and start oxygen. Then connect it to pulse oximetry or multipara monitors and check patient's saturation, blood pressure, and pulse rate. Then you have to cannulate the patient and take blood specifically, specifically uh, especially for VBG or ABG. It's very, very important. Then you can do the other investigations as well. Then disability wise, you can check the glucose level, GCS wise. It's very important. Then the temperature. Then you can do baseline investigation at your uh, ward, like ECG, X-rays. If, if you have facilities to do ultrasound scan, that would be the best thing. Then IV antibiotics, stat doses like aspirin, clopidogrel, then nebulize the patient. If a patient is in hypovolemic situation, then you have to start uh, blood, sometimes over negative blood, and start uh, uh, straight away. Don't give fluid more, it's maximum of 1.5. Not more than that, you can start blood. Once a patient is stabilized after your primary survey, then go for a secondary survey. Then secondary survey, you can do the whatever you want, like CT scan, uh, other investigations, other uh, uh, examinations, like things. Then you can come to the rough diagnosis, and then you have to dispose the patient, disposition the patient towards uh, whether you if you don't have a ton of facilities. Then you can you have to you have to transfer the patient, or whether you you need to transfer this patient to the ICU. So that is what you have to do after the secondary survey. Investigations wise, blood investigation definitely you have to do ABG and VPG. Very important to check the patient's saturation, oxygenation, and carbon dioxide and bicarbonate level. 
Then the full blood count, CRP, blood sugar level is very important. Troponin D dimers are very important as far as pulmonary embolism and ischemic heart disease is concerned. If you need, you can do renal function, liver functions, PTINR and APTT as well. Then the X-ray, important. Yes, basic chest X-ray. If it is a trauma, then you have three main X-rays. Nowadays, we don't do the C-spine, but chest X-ray, pelvic X-rays is very important. Then if you think about pulmonary embolism, yes, you can go for a CTPA or CT chest uh, for trauma patients. Urine is very important to check the ketone bodies, sometimes uh, urine food reports and culture. Bedside investigations are very important. I mean, it's, it's not expensive and not time wasting. So ultrasound scan, bedside echo are very important. You know, fast scan, the uh, special uh, specificity, specificity and uh, sensitivity is very high. So if you are, if you have facilities, try to learn those things. It's very important, and uh, you can survive a lot of patients' life. Right. So after these things, uh, I will explain few uh, disease uh, conditions, and I'm not giving A to Z uh, sort of a thorough, uh, you know explanations, but uh, I will give some salient points. And this is very important to understand these salient points and do it. Uh, right, first one is, uh, everyone knows about asthma. Asthma is a reversible bronchoconstriction. So you have air block between the large airways to alveoli. As a result of that uh, bronchoconstriction, they are, may not be have sort of uh, air inside the alveoli and alveoli may collapse. So patient may be with cyanosis, tachypnea, and sweating. There may be intercostal, subcostal recession, tracheal tract, especially uh, pediatric bed setup. Then you have wrong, it, sh it should be bi bilateral ronca if it is a sort of asthma. And patient may present with silent chest. You have to keep in mind, patient may present with silent chest. It is pre-terminal. If you don't do in uh, minutes, uh, patient may die. Then the tachycardia, low saturation, there may be hypotension as well. So the, the most important thing is this is a reversible bronchoconstriction and there is an inflammatory process going on. So you have to treat for those two things, right? So as for management wise, there are two things is very important. So you have to use bronchodilators to reverse the bronchoconstriction. So what are the bronchodilators we have? Salbutamol, iprotropium, Basically, those are the two things. In addition to that, we use hydro, uh, uh, max sulfate as well. Nowadays, uh, we don't use uh, theopyly much, but basically salbutamol and nephrotropium are very important. In first hour, we can give three cycles, 20 minutes, three cycles of uh, salbutamol and see the difference. If, if after one hour, you can analyze the patient. Uh, patient. The Next uh, thing is anti-inflammatory medications. As the name mentioned, it is a drug of choice for uh, asthma, asthma patients. So anti-inflammatory are very important. We use steroids. A patient can't solo, can start hydrocortisone, but if you can give prednisolone, that would be better. So maximum dose is 50 milligrams, one milligram for KT, right? And uh, hydrocortisone also you can use if a patient is in, uh, um, you know, you know, patient can't solo the thing, right? So the most important thing is anti-inflammatory will take at least four hours to get the action. So meanwhile, you have to manage this patient with bronchodilators for four hours. So that is why it's very important to start anti-inflammatory early as possible. And then we'll take another four hours to get their action. The bronchodilators are, uh, you know, you know, will reverse the situation, but not the treatment. Right. Then they treat the underlying infection, or if there is any allergic reaction, then you have to use adrenaline as well. Then the education is very important. So you have to understand uh, that uh, patient may develop this condition if there is any allergen or any food allergy or something like that. So you have to understand, uh, educate the patients very well. Then the disposition. There are three places you can send. The first one is you have to you can send this patient to the uh, I see if the patient's condition is not improving. The second one is uh, you can send the patient to the ward for further nebulization and uh, 
further management continuation. But otherwise, you can discharge the patient. You can discharge the patient and ask patient to come to the clinic. So imagine after about four hours, patient symptoms are okay. That means that the patient's anti-inflammatory drugs will start to act. So then that point, patient is okay. Then patient you can discharge the patient and ask him them to come to the clinic. So next topic is irreversible situation. This is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The symptoms like exertion or breathlessness, chronic of regular sputum production, and wheezing. So sometimes patient may have uh, history of most of the time. I mean, about ninety percent of the time, patient have history of smoking. So those are the things, and these are the clinical features. Mark dyspnea is there, and tachypnea. First lip breathing is there. Use of accessory muscles, acute confusional stage because of carbon dioxide irritation, and new onset peripheral edema. There are two reasons for that. First one is right heart failure. The second one is there may be uh, hypoalbuminemia because of this uh, sputum production. So the, uh, hypoalbuminemia may associate hyperproteinemia may associate with peripheral edema. So how do you manage these patients? You can go according to the British Thoracic uh, Society guideline. So you can give oxygen. You have to be very careful when you use oxygen for patient with COPD. Try to keep saturation up to about 92. That is more than enough for these patients. And you can use bronchial uh, bronchodilators like salbutamol, uh, protopium. These patients, uh, we can use theophylline as well. You can give a trial of steroid, even though this is not an uh, inflammatory situation, but sometimes patient may work with uh, may work with steroid. So you can give uh, you know I mean same dose as uh, asthma, uh, prednisolone or steroid <coughs> hydrocortisone. The next part is very important: antibiotics. These patients are having sort of a chronic illness over a few years, right? And a patient may have some uh, atypical uh, bacterial infections like uh, Mycoplasma or Legionella. So you have to cover these patients with uh, uh, something like terethromycin or doxycycline. So you can use uh, uh, antibiotics as well in addition to normal antibiotics you use. Right. The next topic is uh, pulmonary edema. This is, this is the problem is muscles, uh, cardiac muscles can't contract well due to poor stretchability. The reasons for that is ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, there may be infections as well. The problem is cardiac oxygen demand exceed the availability. As a result, that there is a hypoxia and acidosis. Air yeah, can't cross, cross the blood interface, so there is no carbon dioxide, oxygen, gas exchange. Fluid seeps from the blood into the alveoli. As a result of that, there is a fluid inside the alveoli and no place to exchange the gas. So surfactant get diluted and caused by cardiac and vascular derangement. It's sort of a vicious cycle. Some or other we have to, I mean, stop one stage at, at this cycle. So that is how you treat the pulmonary edema. So base, basic of uh, treating pulmonary edema is you have to prop up the patient and start oxygen. Keep saturation somewhere less than 95 in this case situation because oxygen is a pulmonary vasodilator. So when you give more oxygen, that will dilate your pulmonary vessels and more fluid retention is there. So that will act as a negative uh, uh, effect on the heart failure. So don't give more, more, too much of oxygen. Try to keep saturation about 92, 93 is more than enough for heart failure patient. Then uh, you have to start two things. The first one is GTN infusion. If blood pressure is about 100, more than 110, you can start small dose of GTN, like five mics per kg per minute. Or, uh, you know, its book says it's about 100, but uh, I, I, I don't think it's uh, practical for an hour setup. Probably about 110 is okay. So just try to start GTN. GTN is very short actin uh, uh, vasodilator. So when you stop, we'll take about maximum uh, couple of minutes to uh, uh, disappear its action. 
so don't worry about the hypertension uh, hypotension so start minimum dose of uh, you know gtn infusion if blood pressure is more than 110 but if it is less than 100 don't start uh, gtn infusion the second one is cpap cpap means uh, what you do is cpap will recruit your alveoli and it will push down your uh, fluid inside the alveoli and there is it will increase your uh, surface area of alveoli as a result of that there is a place for uh, gas exchange right so this is very important to know that don't give too much fluid, uh, oxygen and gtn infusion and cpap is very important in heart failure prusamide we used to give prusamide but nowadays we don't give fusamide because the re only reason is like fusamide will take about 20 minutes to its action. So for 20 minutes is a very critical period for heart failure patients. So, so if you don't have anything, yes, you don't have a CPAP machine, you don't have a GTN, yes, you can start fusamide. But please remember, if you have those facilities, don't give fusamide straight away. You can use to use fusamide if your blood pressure is low about 100. So you can start fusamide infusion one or two milligrams per hour, like very small infusion, but don't give much fusamide for patients uh, with heart failure as a first choice, right? Then uh, the second one is you have to restrict the fluids, somewhere around 1,000 to 1 1.5 liters per day. So it is very important to restrict fluids because the problem is uh, preload. That, that's why we start uh, renal dilators and things and reduce the preload. The other problem is the muscle itself. So in that case, we can start inotropes as well. But, uh, but the thing is, you have to treat for the cause. So heart failure doesn't come straight away. And uh, uh, you have to do something for that. So the treatment uh, for its precipitating factors so what are the precipitating factors? Ischemic heart disease, then you have to start thrombolysis and primary PCI if you have health facilities. But most of the uh, teaching hospital have got uh, cat, cat, cat lab, but uh, I don't think it's general hospital. So basically what you can do is you have to start thrombolysis then and there within, uh, uh, within a reasonable period of time. There is arrhythmias, then uh, and patient's blood pressure is low, hypo, patient is unstable, then you can you have to go for a cardioversion, mainly electrical cardioversion. So otherwise, yes, you can go for a chemical cardioversion. Antihypertensives, uh, the patient develop uh, hypertensive pulmonary edema, you have, can start GTN infusion. Apart from that, ABCD means uh, AC inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics start for the hypertension. Inotropes is very important. As I earlier mentioned, it's a problem with muscles, uh, stretchability is reduced. So what you can do is we can start positive inotropes like W epitomine uh, for these patients. The problem with inotropy is it will increase your heart rate and oxygen consumption. So try to give it minimum doses, otherwise it will increase your heart rate. But uh, in case of uh, uh, myocarditis, we have to start inotropes and be careful with uh, the medications and fluid. Antibiotics, so sometimes in sepsis, uh, there may be a cytotoxic effect on heart. So in that case, yes, you need to start antibiotics as well. Referral is very important for these patients, especially when you work in, a, in an emergency department. So a cardiac referral is very important. You can ask, uh, I mean, the facilities for PCI and, um, you know, it's very important. Then the disposition, as I earlier mentioned, ICU, HDU, or ward, uh, I don't think uh, this patient you can discharge on that day. But uh, keep in mind that uh, it's very important to arrange other facilities for these patients like thrombolysis, PCI, you know, in, uh, in case of, uh, you know, cardioversions, very important. These are the skills you have to develop at your level in the emergency department, like cardioversion, electrical cardioversions is very important, resuscitation and sardine inotropes is very important. It's not a topic to uh, discuss about inotropes, but it's very important to read uh, about inotropes as well. Next topic is very 
common topic is pneumonia. Nowadays, it's very common. Infection in the lower airway, it's uh, associated with consolidation. Consolidation means fluid in the alveoli. Fluid means it's basically pus inside the alveoli. Often only one part of a lung is uh, associated, uh, I mean involved. But if you take that atypical pneumonia, like, you know, in COVID uh, infections, uh, both lungs are involved. You can see patchy consolidation all over the lungs and uh, you can hear the crepitations all over the lung on both sides. The problem with the fever here is like fever increases the metabolic demands of oxygenation and as a result of that your heart rate, sorry, respiratory rate is increased more. So lethargy, cough, cough may associate with uh, hemoptysis, uh, chest pain, uh, then uh, atypical features like diarrhea, lethargy, and body ache. These are the other features associated with pneumonia. Uh, you know, treatment-wise, antibiotic bacterial, and you have to think about atypical phenomena, atypical bacteria as well, Mycoplasma, Legionella, things like that. And then you have to start symptomatic treatment like paracetamol, bronchodilators. Nowadays, it's COVID uh, infections, uh, symptomatic treatments is very important for these patients because we don't have any treatment for COVID uh, uh, infection. Non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation if needed. In that situation, we have to send the patient to the uh, HDU ICU. I just want to emphasize a few uh, thing, a few uh, details about uh, COVID-19 uh, nowadays. It's very important to identify the COVID uh, hypoxia as early as possible. So in that situation, uh, you can treat with uh, nasal prono, uh, uh, nasal prone oxygen or even mask. But uh, when when the saturation dropped up to uh, less than about 80 to 70, it's very difficult to uh, you know, deal with the patient. So it's very, very difficult situation. Even with CPAP or intubation, uh, you can't, you can, you can't uh, succeed. You know, that's the problem with the uh, COVID situation. I know the situation is very bad here. Monitoring facilities are, I mean, uh, very difficult to do these days. But still, still try to catch up. Uh, you know, uh, hypoxia as early as possible, if, at least uh, in young patients. Then the sepsis. Uh, sepsis uh, is uh, not only pneumonia, but also, you know, abdominal sepsis, uh, necrotizing fasciitis, and that sort of sepsis. So what you have to do is you have to follow the sepsis bundle, one hour bundle, four hour bundle, likewise. So treat the patient as early as possible. That's how you can, uh, you know, cure the patient. So start antibiotics early as possible, IV fluids, uh, if, uh, is, if map, map is less than 60, start the suppressors. The symptomatic treatments, as I said, sometimes you can use hydrocortisone, uh, you know, bronchodilators, as earlier said, that, that sort of a medication you can use as a symptomatic treatment. The most important thing is recognition and treat early as possible. I mean, if you, if you lay it, uh, then it's very difficult to get rid of the problem. Uh, in even with uh, the uh, enough facilities. Next topic is uh, uh, surgical, very important, and that is why that's why I earlier said you have to develop skills when you work in in the emergency department. This is pneumo or hemothorax. Air or blood stuff gets uh, between the inside of the chest wall and the lung. You call parietal, parietal and visceral pleura, in between parietal and visceral pleura. So it's an acute surgical emergency. There are three conditions. The first one is tension pneumothorax, uh, open pneumothorax, and massive pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax means uh, you know air collect inside the pleural and uh, pleura, pleural cavity, and you can get uh, severe uh, emergency situations like hypotension, dyspnea, hypoxia, tachycardia, sort of fixture. So then and there you have to treat the patient, otherwise patient will die within minutes. Open pneumothorax means like there is a wound which act as a sort of a valve. As a result of that uh, air um, 
comes through that wound and collect inside the pleural cavity. Then the massive hemothorax means uh, blood inside the pleural cavity. The collection is more than uh, 1,000 liters, 1,000 milliliters, one liter. The problem is there is uh, two things, hypovolemic shock and uh, then the obstructions as well. So you have to treat the patients accordingly. So how do you treat? If a patient with uh, pneumo or hemothorax presents with the history of trauma, or chest trauma, straight away, you can do the finger thoracotomy. Nowadays, uh, this is the, uh, 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 the management. You can put your finger and make a hole both side of the chest. And no need to put any tubes or anything uh, uh, until you uh, stabilize the patient. Just put uh, your finger in the second uh, um, intercostal space or sorry, in, in the fourth intercostal space and uh, just stabilize the patient. But imagine if a spontaneous pneumothorax who present is, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, tension, then what you can do is you can put a white bone needle inside the anterior chest wall, it's second intercostal space at the midline of the uh, clavicle. Then uh, open pneumothorax, what you can do is you can block the valvular effect valve effects. So what you can do is you apply a plaster, it is called three-side plaster on the chest. Right? So then ultimately for the anything, pneumothorax, hemothorax, or, if I, or even open pneumothorax, uh, you can put an ICT. Once a patient stabilized, especially for trauma patient, then you can put this uh, ICT. Right, this pulmonary embolism, next topic. I think uh, pulmonary embolism is a uh, very rare condition in Sri Lanka. I don't know whether it's rare or we are not uh, investigation properly for this, uh, these patients. Anyway, it's uh, a blood clot inside the pulmonary circulation blocks, especially venous circulation. The symptoms are hypoxia, tachycardia, tachypnea, sometimes chest pain. It's sort of pleuritic type chest pain associated with long travels, uh, history of venous thrombosis and OCP. We are patient with on, if you are on OCP, there is a high chance of getting OCP. So how do you diagnose this patient? Clinically, you can uh, go through this uh, scoring system. First one is well score and uh, then the perks uh, rule. So you can exclude with this uh, scoring system. And uh, then you can go for the other baseline investigations like D timers and CTPA. So treatment wise, you can start ox oxygen and anticoagulation like uh, enoxaparin, and then you can start TPA for thrombolysis. Right, this is non-cardio, non-cardio non pulmonary conditions. It's a very important situation in Sri Lanka because nowadays uh, you can get a lot of pediatric uh, patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Then you have to be very equipped with. Uh, oh, of diabetic um, condition, right? So we have two management plan for both adults and pediatrics, but the ba basic uh, management plan is the same, right? Diabetic ketoacidosis associated tachypnea often without air hunger. You can understand that they have tachypnea without any lung features or intercostal subcostal resistance or something like that. They are Basically, not hypoxic unless patient has got some something like pneumonia or that sort of an infection inside the lung, uh, because pneumonia can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis or even lung injuries can precipitate diabetes unless uh, they don't have hypoxia or other lung features. They have polyuria, polydipsia, loss of weight, and dehydration. How do you diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis? There are three things to fulfill. The first one is history of diabetes or hyperglycemia, blood glucose level is more than 11 millimoles per liter. The second one is acidosis, either metabolic acidosis, pH is less than 7.3 or bicarbonate level is less than 15 millimoles per liter. Third one is ketosis, either blood ketone, ketonemia or urine ketonuria, I mean ketone bodies. So either of them you can use. 
So if there is the, if these three things are there, that is diabetic ketoacidosis. So how do you manage this patient? There are three salient steps. The first one is stop ketone productions. The second one is treat for underlying causes. Third one is prevent from complications. Stop ketone production by starting insulin. You can use 0.5 units per kg power. So very important to understand that we use insulin to stop ketone production and stop acidosis rather than glucose level, hyperglycemia. Yes, hyperglycemia will reduce with insulin, but the main target is to reduce ketone production. So usually we reduce uh, 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliters power, not more than that. If you reduce more than that, then that will increase your cerebral edema. So you have to be very careful when you start in insulin and reducing part to most level. Then the treat for underlying or precipitating factors. There may be infection. You have to start antibiotics. Then you have to do uh, blood uh, uh, culture and things like that. Then it's, there may be ischemic heart disease, sometimes myocardial infarctions. Then you have to treat for that as well. Then the stroke. Yes, stroke can cause uh, can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis, then you have to treat for that if the patient present with the, that time limit, time frame. Prevent from the complication. The most important two complications are there. The first one is hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. When you start insulin, uh, insulin uh, uh, for a patient with hyperglycemia, their potassium level will come down. So be careful with that and check potassium level at least every two hours. Then cerebral edema is very important. That's why we have this protocol to give a, a fluid sort of rational way and uh, reduce uh, glucose very rational way. Otherwise, patient may, patient may die with, the, with this cerebral edema. So we have to be very careful, especially for adults and children. Yeah, children as well. Monitoring is very important for these patients. Uh, not only you know basic uh, pulse rate, blood pressure, uh, things like that, but the other, on the other hand, blood sugar level, uh, pH, uh, and electrolyte level as well. When to stop uh, insulin is very important. So you don't stop insulin. Imagine if blood sugar is level is normal, or if blood sugar is level is two hundred. You have to think about the other levels as well. The glucose level is less than 200. The pH should be less than, sorry, greater than 7.3. So this is the normal level. It should be more than 7.3. And the bicarbonate level is 18 or more than that. So otherwise you don't stop insulin. You have to give it, you oxygen, sorry, insulin with 5% dextrose to stop acidemia and uh, acidemia and ketone production. So it's very important to understand this, this thing. Right, next topic is poisoning. There are two poisoning you can get this near, you know, that carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning because of hypoxia. It's a competitive inhibitor of oxygen binding at hemoglobin site. So you know that it's basically irreversibly binding to the hemoglobin site. So as a result of that, there is a, a carbon monoxide, uh, sorry, there is hypoxia. Treatment wise, overwhelm with the carbon dioxide, overwhelm the carbon dioxide with 100% oxygen. Or if it is not responding, you have to use hyperbaric oxygen. It's other things you have to know about this hyperbaric oxygen um, centers are very few in Sri Lanka. Uh, one is in, you know, probably in Tringomali. The other one is, I think, in some area in Colombo, I can't remember remember, but it's very few centers are there. So it's very difficult to manage uh, with manage carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide poisoning if it is highly toxic uh, situation. The next poison is uh, cyanide poisoning. The inhibition of oxygen utilization at the cellular level. Even though you have plenty of oxygen in the air, in the blood, I mean, uh, cell can't utilize that oxygen because of uh, cyanide poisoning. Management wise, uh, you know that it's time critical situation. So most of the time patient will die. 
and even after presentations, I mean, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, you know, cure the patient. This is the last topic I want to emphasize you. The first one is uh, psychogenic dyspnea. Please uh, keep in this in your mind. So, psychogenic dyspnea, patient may present with dyspnea without any lung signs, right? That is, that is due to anxiety, right? Sometimes panic disorders. But keep in mind that there are other conditions as well, drug withdrawal and hallucinations. So drug withdrawal is very important for this patient. So drug, drug, if the patient present with dyspnea with drug withdrawal situation, their blood pressure may be very high and sometimes their pulse rate is very high and uh, they have uh, the sweating and reduced level of consciousness. So it's uh, the fate of mortality rate is very high in this situation. So these patients, so please, please uh, try to do something these patients as soon as possible. Just for, uh, don't forget about these patients. They say that these are psychogenic and nothing to say. So just check their blood pressure, check their pulse rate, check there whether there is any hypoglycemic situations. So these are the things you have to remember. Then the next thing is, uh, this may be the first episode of psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Patient is probably having some hallucinations. Patient is scared of that hallucination and having sort of a anxiety on that. So just try to clarify, just try to figure it out whether it's due to uh, uh, anxiety or hallucination or drug withdrawal. It's very important to treat this patient, otherwise the patient will die. All right. Okay, any questions? Right. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of questions from the participants. Uh, I think I'll repeat the questions to you so that it's easy for you to answer. Okay. Uh, and the first question is, uh, is it recommended to give IV salbutamol and they cause arrhythmias? Yes, you can start a small dose of uh, IV salbutamol. Uh, probably about uh, one mic uh, per kg per minute and then increase uh, up to probably about five. But the problem is uh, when you give uh, more than three mics, it, patient should be in the ICU. I mean, don't give uh, more than that when a patient is in the uh, emergency department. So monitoring is very important. Yes, so patient can get arrhythmias. That's why we want to send this patient to the ICU. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the next question is, uh, you have already explained this, but just to highlight, what is the current guideline in practice on heart failure management? Uh, uh, the problem is uh, still uh, we don't have a proper guideline system in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have, uh, first one is emergency medicine uh, guideline is there, it's published in 2017. I think it's also said that use uh, fusamide, but uh, uh, when you go to the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, NICE guideline or even in uh, the other guidelines, uh, you can use that guideline. But Sri Lanka, we don't have proper guidelines. Uh, when you when you need uh, any uh, sort of a guidelines, uh, go, go, please go to uh, European uh, Resuscitation Council uh, guidelines or a NICE guideline. That's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, and there's one more question in that, uh, is the first line inotropic agent uh, in heart in acute heart failure? Uh, I mean, they're asking what is the first line inotropic agent in acute heart failure and what is the place of noradrenaline in acute heart failure? Yes, uh, first inotropy should be, uh, you know, uh, dobutamine. Uh, when you increase dobutamine, the problem is uh, you can get high heart rate level, high heart rate. So, that is a problem. But uh, apart from that, uh, uh, you can start uh, noradrenaline small dose. But uh, my uh, choice is like, you know, you can start dobutamine uh, first and then uh, you can uh, combine with uh, small dose of noradrenaline. Thank you, sir. And uh, one more question on what are the difference in treating be uh, treatment between acute and chronic heart failure? Uh, 
we are treat the pulmonary edema and uh, uh, low saturation like you know uh, basically we have to treat for the acute heart failure that is the most uh, important thing and the uh, fate uh, mortality is very high so chronic heart failure is uh, heart modification drugs you use as a uh, you know there are a few more life uh, heart modification medications like ACE inhibitors, uh, beta blockers, uh, and things like that. But chronic acute heart failure, yes, first one is uh, you have to reduce the preload and recruit your bronchioles. So that's why we need uh, GTN and uh, uh, CPAP. But chronic heart failure, uh, I, I think you are asking acute uh, versus chronic, not uh, asking acute versus acute on chronic, right? So acute on chronic, yes, definitely you have acute on chronic, you have to treat for the acute heart failure. Then the life, sorry, heart modification medications like acid, uh, acid inhibitors, beta blockers, you can use with some uh, uh, frosamide or some diuretics. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the next question is, uh, if an asthma patient comes with acute asthma, but is also having a COVID, how can we treat and can we still give prednisolone? You know that uh, we use uh, dexamethasone in, uh, you know, the, nowadays we call it as chopsy. After uh, day five, patient develop hypoxia with uh, hypoxia, I mean, saturation is less than 95. With uh, dyspnea, you use uh, chopsy. Chopsy includes uh, four things dexamethasone, eight milligrams, uh, then uh, uh, keftriaxone, uh, enoxaparin. Uh, and uh, sometimes we use uh, clarithromycin as well. So in that situation, we use dexamethasone as an anti-inflammatory medications. But apart from that, if a patient has got some bronchi, yes, definitely you can use uh, salbutamol in, uh, in nebulization, nebulization or inhalation. So definitely you can use it. And, uh, uh, but uh, apart from that, hydrocortisone or prednisolone we don't use because we already started uh, dexamethasone and we have to give it for about, I think, uh, four or five days. Oh, thank you very much, sir. sir please <coughs> bear with us. We are getting more questions <coughs> from the participants. And the next question is, what is the exact pathophysiology of COVID pneumonia? Is it acute pneumonitis kind of immune mediated? So I'm not expert in, uh, <laughs> I haven't done any research on that, but according to my knowledge, and I heard from a few uh, lectures, for first couple of days, you are getting uh, viremia because of the COVID infection. So body will uh, react to that viremia by in, uh, act like as, uh, you know, you increase your inflammatory markers. So leukotrienes uh, will increase in your body sometimes uh, that can go sort of a hyper uh, reaction. So as a result of that, you can get uh, uh, prob most likely it's a immune-mediated immune pneumonitis, that's what uh, they say. So after about four days, a patient develop, uh, you know, dyspnea, features of pneumonia, that is called most likely it's immune-mediated uh, pneumonitis. So that's why we use dexamethasone, uh, you know, enoxaparin, and sometimes uh, that uh, condition will secondary infected with the bacteria. So that's why we use uh, keftriaxone. So basically it's uh, immune mediated uh, pneumonitis, but no one knows the real pathology up to now, but uh, they say it's most, most uh, you know, researchers and uh, uh, predictors say that it's basically immune mediated pneumonitis. Thank you. So that was a great explanation. And the next question is, what is the placement of needle in needle thoracosynthesis? Uh, is it a second intercostal space or safe triangle? No, it's uh, the thing. Uh, the reason is uh, you, you put the white book needle cannula into the second intercostal space in the case of uh, uh, pneumonia, uh, sorry, pneumothorax, right? So if it is a, a pneumothorax, yes, definitely it should be in the second intercostal space. Safe triangle is to put your IC tube and your finger thoracotomy, right? So basically, uh, uh, placement of needle in needle thoracotomy is in the second intercostal space rather than the safe triangle, right? So if you want to put the IC tube or your finger, yes, definitely in your safe triangle, not in the second intercostal space. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, we have got few more questions in DKA. Uh, how does a DKA patient develop cerebral edema? What is the pathophysiology there? Can you please explain? And uh, in the same topic, we got how does more insulin can worsen the cerebral edema in DKA? Yeah, the thing is this, like, you know, uh, DKA patients, this, uh, the hyperglycemia is not a sudden onset procedure. So it has been there for some time. So your brain cells are used to the situations like with hyperglycemic situations. When you give more insulin or if you reduce uh, insulin suddenly, what will happen is uh, they will shrink. As a result of that, uh, they will take more fluid inside into the neuron, neuron cells. Then they will get swollen. Right, so that's what happened. So that's why you want to give it sort of a, a symptomatic, uh, sort of a uh, you know systematic way. Otherwise, if, if you give sudden, if you reduce suddenly, what will happen is all cells swollen and get uh, get swell. So that's what happened in uh, uh, cerebral edema. Don't give uh, uh, more fluids or don't don't reduce. Uh, glucose sort of a rapidly. That's the two things we have to keep in your mind. That's why we want to give also fluid in a separate sort of a systematic way. Like, you know, first, first hour, one liter, second hour, two liters, likewise. First two hours, sorry, two liters, then four liters. Likewise, we have to give it. Otherwise, uh, the cell get swollen and then as a result of that, there is a selling. The next question is, uh, does more insulin can worsen? Yes, that's what I say. Like, you know, if you give more insulin, what will happen is you will reduce your uh, glucose level suddenly, right? So then that will that, that's what happened. So then uh, glucose come out and there will be a uh, sort of selling. The most important thing is uh, we don't give insulin to reduce. Uh, yeah, we give insulin to reduce uh, glucose. But the most important thing is we want to reduce the acidemia and bicarbonate production. Sorry, uh, uh, ketone body production. That is why we want to give uh, insulin and reduce the acidemia rather than reducing the blood glucose level. Thank you, sir. Uh, and the next question is from carbon monoxide poisoning. As partial pressure, pressure of oxygen is normal in the carbon monoxide poisoning, can it cause dyspnea? So and the dyspnea can, can, can associate with two things, as I earlier mentioned, the hypoxia and acidosis. If there is no hypoxia or acidosis, I mean, no one can simulate your uh, respiratory center. So then there won't be any dyspnea. But if there is hypoxia or carbon dioxide, uh, sorry, uh, acidosis, then definitely there is uh, increase your re respiratory resp they will uh, stimulate your respiratory center and increase your respiratory rate. Yes, the problem is if there is no hypoxia, I don't think they can uh, stimulate your respiratory center. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have got a few more questions, sir. What type of hypoxia we develop in COVID? A hypoxia may be associated with uh, uh, as it's, it's called hypoxic hypoxia because uh, this COVID problem increase your, uh, uh, as I earlier said, uh, inflammatory markers. And there is a condition called uh, respiratory uh, uh, ARDS, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So as a result of that, there is a COVID and there is a poor VQ mismatch, right? So that is how they will get the hypoxia. The carbon dioxide oxygen exchange is very low. So that's what happened in COVID as well. So it's basically hypoxic hypoxia due to poor VQ mismatch. Thank you, sir. Uh, the other questions we have already explained, but a few more to uh, find out, sir. What is the action of GTN in heart failure? And what is the immediate action of prosimide in heart failure? Is it uh, venodilate or diuresis? Yes, the first one is uh, DTN is a venodilator. So that is how you reduce your preload. So reduce preload means uh, 
you can have uh, you can reduce your pulmonary uh, uh, edema as well. Uh, Prusamide is a first action is is an arteriodilator. So that is how they will uh, they get the uh, response. But the problem is with take some time. So at least about 15, 20 minutes will take to get the action. So that is the reason you don't, uh, nowadays you don't use uh, Prusamide as a first line treatment. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's all the questions for today. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir, for that excellent presentation. And uh, I really thank you uh, on behalf of GMOA and Society for Health Research and uh, Innovation spending your valuable time here today with us, sir. And uh, also, we would like to present your talk of appreciation. I think that will reach you uh, in a few days. Um, and thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much again. And uh, thank you all for the participation. Uh, please uh, follow the link in the chat box uh, to receive your participation certificate. Uh, that's the end of the webinar. We'll be keeping the um, Zoom meeting for some time uh, for you all to fill the uh, Google form for the participation certificate. Uh, you can please find the link in the chat box. Uh, so that's the end of the webinar today. Thank you all again. And I'm Dr. Sinta signing off. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.